It is good to be in the house of the Lord this morning as we continue our series on connecting with God. And uh, we looked at Nehemiah 8, 1 through 9, a passage that uh, probably not preached from very often as you uh, might not have ever heard it preached from this. It's, a, it's kind of an unusual uh, passage, one that, that um, we're going to talk about as far as uh, what it tells us about the community. And we're going to draw out some, some application from it. If I can turn this page and get to my sermon notes. Um, and, you know, it just seems like sometimes technical problems and every little thing comes along, doesn't it? And so, you know, you get snake bit sometimes, but that's okay. Um, our introduction, the introduction to this is as we're, is, is we're connecting with God. It's our sermon series. But the title of, of today's sermon is Meeting God in Scripture. And when I refer to scripture, I'm talking about the Bible. I'm talking about the Old Testament and the New Testament. I'm talking about the, the Christian scripture and, 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 and how it speaks to us. See, the Bible is for all human life with God. It speaks with purpose, with meaning, with power, and with authority. And so as we look at this passage, which uh, Judy read about the, the people of of Israel as they have returned from exile. Uh, they've returned to Judah and Jerusalem. They have been in exile because why? Because they had not lived up to their covenant uh, portion with God. They had not obeyed God and eventually they paid the consequence for their evil, the idolatry against uh, and their worshiping of other gods, uh, those sort of things. And so they were eventually lost their homeland, their country, and were taken off by the Assyrians and the Babylonians. Okay, and It's called the exile, which was a very uh, trying time for the nation of Israel. But God, even in that time, sent prophets to say, I am not done with you. I am still in relation with you. I would I still have a remnant. I, there is still hope. You will be restored back to the promised land. So he, I'm reminded that even now, when we look around our world and we see how messed up it is, and we see how, probably especially because next week you know, we'll get election results, and depending on your viewpoint, I don't care whose viewpoint, the whole thing's messed up. Okay? It's gonna sometimes seem like there's no hope and God says to his people back then in exile as he says to his people today there is hope there is hope because our, if your hope is grounded in God if your hope is in anything else you're going to be disappointed so we see the people are returning uh, the temple is that had been torn down that, that had been demolished during the conquest they are beginning to rebuild it they are rebuilding it and they're rebuilding the walls and they're rebuilding their country and they're rebuilding their lives. And amongst the people that have returned uh, from Babylon are these priests and scribes and Levites and temple servants. Uh, but the people themselves, the, the run of the mill, the regular people, the, the people of God, the Jewish people have lost touch with their culture, their religious traditions. More, more importantly, they've lost touch with God. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes I wonder as a leader in the church, I'm not talking about Bethany specifically, I'm talking about church universal. That includes those of you who are out on YouTube and Facebook, the church, you're part of the church. I wonder if sometimes we've lost touch with God. If, if we've gotten so concerned about other things or, or we just don't know, we, 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 we're not in his presence or we just have lost touch. Do you ever get that feeling you've lost? I myself, in my own deal, feel like sometimes in my family because I've lost all my grandparents and I've lost my parents and all I've got is my two brothers left and we're all living busy lives. I've lost touch with my family and with the Morris heritage, so to speak. And who the Morrises were, and, and that is, it especially drives home to me during the holiday times when you know we, you share with family and you share those stories. Losing touch with who we were and how we grew up. Well, that's what these people have as they return back home, and everything they had known before has changed, and they're having to rebuild it. They're having to clean it up, rebuild it, all the land, the walls around Jerusalem, and all of that. And so they. 
they, they begin to do that and rebuild. And so they gather, and what do they do? They gather to meet God. And how do they meet God? They meet Him through Scripture. And that's the thing I want to look at today. They meet Him. They gather to read, to hear, to learn, and to understand God through Scripture. And so it says, And all the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate. They came in a unified sense, hungering after God. And they told Ezra, the scribe, to bring the book of the law of Moses. Bring the Bible. Bring, let us hear the word of God. Now, a lot of these people were not able to read on their own. So they were dependent on somebody else who had, who, who had the skills, who was literate to be able to read. So they said, bring that. We need to hear the word of God. And, and it also says that the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law as Ezra read it. And as he opened it, all the people stood. There was, there was an acknowledgement of what the Bible meant. So I've got three points that I want to look at in this kind of unusual story as we get a glimpse of the rebuilding of Israel, of, the, of God coming back in touch and speaking to his people. How do you get in touch with God? As I look at this passage, there's no difference between the people standing in that square that day and myself. They needed to hear from God. You need to hear from God. I need to hear from God. We have gathered in this place to hear from God. We have gathered through the miracle of the internet to meet with God. And so what do we do? We open the word of God, the Bible. It's the word of God to hear his words. Okay, they gathered to hear. And what happened when he opened the book, they stood, they stood in reverence. And we see that they, as they hear it, they say amen and amen and they lift their hands and they bow their heads and they worship God. When we hear the word of God, when we hear God's word preached, when we hear it read, when we read it ourselves, we enter into his presence, we hear from God, and we have a natural inclination, especially those of us who are followers of Christ, to worship him. So we need to hear to and read God's word. God's word is the living word. You ever heard, heard it described as the living word? The Bible, the living word, and, and reading of it does not come back void. And there have been many that have been saved simply by the reading without a, a fancy church service or, or a fancy preacher to preach the word. We, a couple weeks back, we had a Gideon speaker who came and even shared the power of a simple New Testament in the hands of somebody who could read it. Now, what he didn't talk to you about is that a lot of those Gideon New Testaments are in how many different languages, Her Over over 90. Over 90 different languages. Why? Because there is the power of the the spoken out loud word of God. In over 200 countries. In over 200 countries. Why? Because it's, why is that important? Why, can't, why don't they just learn English so they can read the Bible? Well, number one, the Bible was not originally written in English. I have news for you. <laughs> so I'm glad I didn't have to, although I have, I have acquainted myself a little bit with Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic. I'm glad I didn't have to learn those languages in order to hear the word of God. I'm glad somebody translated it into English. But God's word is primary. It's central to our lives as followers of Christ. It's central to our lives as Christians. It's central to our walk and who we are. And, and, and it should be central to our everyday life. If the only time you crack that book, of that spine of your Bible is on Sundays, you are malnourished, my friend. You are malnourished. Open it, read it. Study it, hear it. There's something also about reading it out loud to yourself. Now, I read my Bible, and most of the time I read like everybody else, you know, you read it in your head. But there's something about the spoken word of God, even if you read it to yourself. And they had a respect for the word of God. It says they stood when it was open, and, the, and we've lost a lot of that. We've lost a lot of respect for the word. How can I, how do I know we've lost a lot of respect for the word? By the way we treat the word. If we treat the word as something we go to to win an argument, 
to pull some scripture out to win an argument and or, or we and, and we're not treating it properly because we're pulling things out of context we're proof texting we're finding a proof that supports what we want to support in the Bible well I can find just about anything any small part of scripture that would support just about anything I wanted to say okay I could I could preach a sermon on on all sorts of things by pulling certain scriptures out. But when you pull them out of context, it's kind of like a lot of the political language we hear being thrown around. You gotta wonder, is that what that person really said? They probably really said that, but did you pull it out of context? I'm glad that 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 something that you know rarely in my life have my wife and I pulled each other's uh, language out of context. <laughs> Right? Well, you said this. <coughs> Sorry. Yeah. Well, no, that's not what I meant. Uh, if you'd listen to me all the way, and, and, and we do that, don't we? We catch on certain things. Well, an active studying of God's word, seeking to hear God, treating the word as important, will help us in our relationship. It says that they they gathered to hear. And they sought to understand. And there were those there that had understanding of the word. And it was as Ezra read the word, then the Levites and the other scribes uh, of the law were to help the people to understand. Okay? We, in our own day and age, we have the church. The church is here to help people understand the word of God. We're here. Our mission is just not just proclamation, not just Proclaiming Christ and inviting those to accept him. It is that. But it is also to disciple them. And to help them understand the word of God. And the walk of God. And so if, if the only thing you have endeavored in. Is just accepting Christ. And you haven't, haven't come alongside somebody. Or, 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 or gotten into a Sunday school class. Or gotten into a Bible study. Or listened to. to you know there's a, a ton of these things. The Bible studies and find you a good Bible study to be part of so that you can seek to understand what is being said. They hear. They sought to understand. Words have staying power. Sticks and stones may break my bones and words will never hurt me. That is a lie. I heard that in grade school. But mostly, the, the things that hurt me the most were words. Words from bullies. Words from people. Words that we say to one another are hurtful, aren't they? Our words can be hurtful or our words can be graceful. Our words can be hurtful or our words can be used of God to strengthen and to yeah, build one another up. Follower of Christ, the word of God. God gives us hope, the hope that is found in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who died on the cross for our sin. It's the word of God, the sacrifice. We're coming into the Christmas season, the Christmas season, Emmanuel, God with us. There's no greater hopeful time in the year, except maybe Easter, <coughs> when we should celebrate and, and, and know that the word of God is powerful. It's transforming. It's transforming. My father could say a word to me that would break me down or say a word that would build me up. Parents, those of you out there, parents, grandparents, what are you instilling in your kids? Are you telling them you are proud of them? Are you instilling words that build them up? God, through his word, wants to instill into you the children of God, those who have accepted Christ, he wants to instill into you the blessing. He wants to say you are loved. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. For God so loved you, for God so loved me, that he gave the greatest sacrifice he could. These are the transforming, this is the transforming power. The word of God is to be studied. If you don't understand it, you are to seek to understand it. 
Or seek out those who do, who can you can ask questions to. 2 Timothy 3, 14 through 17 says, All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. It's good for teaching. It's good for reproof. And see, when you read the scripture, if as a follower of Christ, you have the Holy Spirit guiding you. And it's the Holy Spirit that as you read, if you ever read scripture and you got convicted, got convicted about something you were doing, that's the Holy Spirit using scripture to, to, to reproof you or to give you correction. And you are to be open to it. Scripture speaks to us. No, so we need to get in touch with God through reading the Bible, number one. Number two, we need to hear and read the Bible. And number three is Bibles, is the Bible or Scripture brings connection. The Bible or Scripture brings connection with God. If it wasn't for the Bible, would you be as close to God? If it wasn't for the fact that God has preserved that document, those words over thousands and thousands of years, this Earlier this year, before all the COVID hit, y'all know we, we got to go to Israel. And uh, one of my, the highlights of it was uh, visiting the Qumran, where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. But, but we also went to the museum that housed, uh, uh, housed uh, many of those Dead Sea Scrolls. And, and they had this, they had this deal of the, one, the main one in the Dead Sea Scrolls that they found is they found the book of Isaiah, the entire book of the Isaiah. This was the oldest one that had ever been found. And you know what? It was almost exactly the same as what they currently had, giving proof to the accuracy of God's preserving presence in his word. In bringing that word to you, God has acted. It's his living word. Just as in our family, I talked about a, a while ago about being in touch with family. As you gather around, maybe maybe for Halloween, I, I heard I heard some last night at the trunk or treat. I heard some people remembering what they did as a kid when they were in Hallow at Halloween. And then, you know, we do it at Thanksgiving, we do it at Christmas, and the family gather around. My family used to gather around and they'd always tell stories about each of us, okay? And then as a kid, they weren't always the stories you wanted remembered, but man, the rest of the family loved them, didn't they? They loved telling the, the good stories, you know, about how you did this or how, my, my family used to tease me because when I first learned to spell, I didn't know how to spell my name backwards. And so uh, for years I got called Gerg, G-E-R-G, -E I, was, I was Gerg. And, and they love that, you know. That it's the stories of the family that bond it together. It's the stories of God that bond us together. It's the stories of God in the Bible that bonds you with that early Christian who accepted Christ, who he who he encountered walking the God, and he wrote the Gospel of Matthew. You see, you are connected with Matthew, the writer of the first gospel. You are connected with all those names that Judy read a while ago. They were some weird names. You're connected with them. Why? Because they knew God and they listened to his scriptures. We are connected across the ages. We are connected because of the blood of Christ. We are connected because of God. God brings connection. And as they heard the scriptures, what did they do? They wept because they were convicted. They wept because of all that God offered them. They wept because they had been disobedient to God. They wept. And then that weeping from hearing the scripture brought about a strengthening of their faith. You see, faith is found and the faith is strengthened through scriptures. Our faith is found through reading about what Christ has done for us and how it's offered freely to anyone who wants to accept Christ. See, scripture must be approached differently from reading of literature. That's why I always find it interesting when, when schools, public school system wants to teach the Bible and, and, and all the church, yeah, yeah, we need to have the Bible. Yeah, but most of the time in a public school setting when they teach the Bible, they teach the Bible as literature, not as a faith book, okay? And 
I never understood how you could do that because it's a faith book. How can you take the faith dimension of God out of scripture? I don't think you really can. It, there are those in our world, they're intellectual. Sometimes we hear about seminary presidents that no longer believe that Jesus was the son of God. Or that they, and we say, how can they be a seminary? How can they be part of a religious organization and, and their job be that and not acknowledge Christ as Savior and not know about the main thing that the Bible was about? Why? Because they approach it as an academic endeavor. They approach it as literature, no different than teaching Beowulf, Gilgamesh, of Mice and Men, War and Peace, and all those other books we ugged about reading in English, right? There's a difference between the Bible and an academic pursuit. Don't look at the Bible from an abstract intellectual point of view, but regard it as a living document that can be understood in terms of your own spiritual journey and, ex and, and your own experiences that bring you into relationship with God. Let me read that one more time, okay? Because that's key. Don't look at the Bible as an abstract intellectual point of view but regard it as a living document that can be understood in terms of your own spiritual journey and experiences in relation to God. Many of you have photo albums in your families, don't you? And many of us, when we lose someone in the family, we pull those out. Or when something, when we're at holidays, we pull those out. Someone who looks at those, I remember the first time I went, Home Thanksgiving with Judy a bit of college and they pulled out all the, the family albums for me to look through. She was like, oh, great. And I looked at that. It was a photo album. There's the photos. There were, you know. But it wasn't until they started telling me the stories of what this picture was and what this meant and what was going on here and all that. See, that's, you can, you can look at a picture or a story in the Bible but until you connect it with the total story, the thread of the Bible, the thread of grace and mercy, the thread of God's love reaching out to you, you don't understand the full of the Bible. You need to seek to understand. You need to seek to realize that it's that journey of God revealing himself to mankind. It's that journey of God trying to redeem mankind. It's that journey of God showing his ultimate love for mankind in the greatest way possible through the death and resurrection of Christ. See, we meet God through the use of the gift of the Bible. Use it in worship, study, meditation, and learning to connect more with God. There's always room for improvement in our connection. Avoid approaching the Bible slow, slowly, solely. Avoid approaching the Bible solely in an analytical level, seek to use it to further your own particular viewpoint or agenda. That's not what it's for. Use it as a means to encounter God. Allow God to use it as your guide. See, many of us don't hold scripture in high regard. We want to take the word, and I've said this multiple times, and I'll say it again. We want to take the word and we want to read into it. When the word needs to be held high, and read into us. Okay? The scripture reads into us, not us into scripture. That's how God uses his word for us to connect. So if God can use the Bible to reach those who are not believers, just think what lessons he can use it for to teach those who already know him and those who approach it with an open and eager heart ready to meet him. May God bless the proclamation of his word.